All right, so uh, my name is Ben Ehrman. I'm the new Colorado Adrian Health Program Specialist with CSU. Um, so I'm kind of new to poultry as myself, but I'm going to talk about biosecurity today and preventing disease um, in your own backyard flocks as well as, you know, kind of relates to commercial poultry, but not as much. Um, so the biggest takeaway is definitely going to be once disease is in your flock, it's there to stay. Um, this is because a lot of poultry diseases are untreatable or uncurable. Um, and so if your birds get it, they will either live with it or they will die with it. Um, and so that's why biosecurity is so important, especially nowadays with high path avian influenza going around. Um, so the first thing kind of is, you know, what is biosecurity? And to put it simply, it's just a set of management practices that are aimed at reducing the risk of disease in your flock. Um, and since you are like the owners of these birds, it's everything that you can do to protect these birds because they can't really protect themselves. They're under your watch and your care. And so it's everything you can do to protect them. Um, this slide is also kind of a shout out to USD and APHIS's Defend the Flock program. Um, they're a really good resource for information and like people to contact on like about security questions and sick bird questions. Um, just a really good resource. They have a lot of good information on their website. Um, there is a link on the slide for it, but if you just type in defend the flock on the internet browser, it'll pop up. Um, so we kind of put together a little four basic kind of biosecurity things that I'm going to talk about. Um, there's all in all out flock management, cleanliness, keeping species separate, and then purchasing birds from reputable sources. And then I'm going to go a little bit in each one of these. So all in, all out flock management. Um, it's basically that any birds that leave your premises or are coming into your premises kind of stay together and you don't mix birds that have come and gone. So if you're taking birds to a show, so you have 20 birds, you take 10 to a show and 10 back are left at home. You don't want to put those birds back in without isolating them back because wherever you took them to, you could have got a disease, you could have picked up bugs, um, you could have picked up something like that. So typically we recommend isolating for a, two weeks between if you're taking birds from your own flock. If you're buying new birds, however, it's highly recommended that you keep them separate for about 30 days um, until you know that they're healthy, they're bug free, they're disease free. And then of course, if you have sick birds, you wanna notice it right away. You wanna quarantine those birds. You wanna put them in their own area to where they can get access to food and water and they don't have to worry about the other birds, maybe kind of pushing them out and kind of getting them away. Um, and then you wanna report it. You know, If you're noticing anything, give CSU a call, give uh, your vet a call. Uh, wait, the poll popped up on my screen. Um, give someone a call that, to report your sick birds if you have any concern for them. And the last thing on this one is kind of limiting visitors to your flocks. Um, a lot of people who have chickens maybe have friends who have chickens or just friends who like chickens and they want to see them. Um, we kind of recommend if you can keep your you know, visitors down to a minimum, that's kind of best. Um, but if you do let people in, the next thing is kind of cleanliness, which I'll go into next. Um, so if you're having your friends and you visit, the biggest, biggest thing is having clean coop clothes. Um, at a bare minimum, you want to have a special set of shoes, boots, Crocs, you know, whatever you got that only stays in your coop, only stays with those birds. It never leaves um, the premise. And then uh, it's really good. So anyone who's in and out of your flock regularly, make them have a pair of shoes. If you have a couple extra, just random pairs of boots that your friends can wear to keep their feet out. Um, cause that's one of the biggest ways that we track in disease. So with diseases, a lot of times it's not bird to bird. It's, we bring it in ourselves or in commercial industries, it's from trucks, bringing things in, um, equipment and stuff like that. They'll bring the disease. So if you can have boots or coveralls, um, that's the best thing to keep just with the flock right outside of the coop door. And you want to put those on each and every time you go in. And then with equipment, um, any equipment that you use, you know, shovels, rakes, whatever it may be, you want to keep that to yourself. Try not to share with other people. If you absolutely have to, the biggest thing is clean the tool, get all the dirt, dirt, muck, grime, poop, whatever it is off of it, and then sanitize it also. So you want to clean and sanitize. 
uh, make sure that it looks just like how it was when you bought it. Um, and then the same thing when you return it, if you are borrowing equipment, which isn't recommended. Um, and last thing, of course, you know, cleaning, bedding, litter and stuff regularly. Um, that's just good habits, fresh water every day for the birds, make sure they always have water. And then foot baths, if you have a foot bath, that's more related to commercial industries. Um, but you want to make sure you change those regularly. They're just a cleaning device that you step into that has either a disinfectant of some sort in it. Um, you want to make sure those stay clean because if they're dirty, you're not stepping into cleaner anymore. You're just stepping into disease and bacteria and things that it's harboring. And so the next thing is keeping species separate. So this one is especially important right now with IPATH, um, avian influenza going around. Um, a lot of diseases aren't identical in each species. So things that chickens can have, um, turkeys might be more symptomatic towards or have more morbidity or mortality with it. And same with ducks and chickens and water, uh, turkeys. All of them need to be kept separate. So if you, it's fun to have them all together, but things like microplasm, um, chickens can kind of carry that around and be rather okay, but turkeys will have clinical signs and they will start to die. Um, and then with ducks and waterfowl, these ones are really scary because uh, they are known reservoirs for uh, avian influenza. And so if they, whether it's a wild bird or your own ducks, if they get in with your chickens, they can possibly carry it and give it to your chickens and turkeys. And then chickens and turkeys are not gonna survive through avian influenza. So it's really important to keep your species separate whether it's your own birds or even wild birds, you wanna keep them out as much as you can. The last thing, um, it's probably one of the more tricky ones is buying from reputable sources. This one gets really difficult because some sources like feed stores and organic um, flocks, it might sound reputable, it might sound like a good idea, um, but it's not necessarily always that case. Um, these sometimes can be the most prone to disease because of just the nature of their organizations. Um, so you wanna kind of look into wherever you're buying them from, make sure they have good biosecurity practices, make sure they keep things clean and tidy and separate. Um, and, you know, check if they're in any surveillance programs, check if they're in the National Poultry Improvement Plan, see if they are monitored for influenza and salmonella, um, different diseases. Um, it's definitely good to make sure they're doing those things. Um, the best one I would always say is if you can find a place that vaccinates for Merrick's disease, that is one of the biggest things that will help you in the long run, especially if you're a first time buyer is find a feed store or someplace that has vaccinated Merrick's chicks. And so, and then appearance of birds also, that one's pretty easy. If you walk into a store, you know, you want your birds to be nice little fluffy chicks, or if they're full grown chickens, they have their feathers, they look healthy. Um, so yeah, you wanna buy from places that seem like they took good care of their chickens. Uh, this slide is a little diagram one of our vet students put together. It's a little chaotic, but the point is that disease is, travels very, very easily, very quickly, um, sometimes without us even realizing how it got there. So in the middle, it shows a little house, maybe that's your house, your boots, your chickens. You know, you're, you're wearing those boots in with your coop in the morning, then maybe you have to go out and do something. Maybe you need to go to the feed store, get some food, get some bedding, um, whatever you just tracked in with your chickens, you just brought to the feed store and anyone else who did the same thing as you just tracked in their things. And you don't know who's bringing in diseases and then anything they brought in, you're gonna bring back out with you, bring back to your flock, um, give to maybe any of the animals that are inside of the feed store. A lot of those places have baby chickens and you don't wanna get them infected. Um, maybe they have stuff that you don't have. Um, stuff like county fair also. Um, county fairs, as much fun as they are, they are very dirty events. Um, we try and check for, you know, health of poultry. You hope everyone's bringing in show birds and something fantastic, but stuff slips through. Bugs, you know, hide on uh, animals, diseases hide on animals. And so you bring your boots that you had with your chickens to this place, you're going to bring it back. And then um, your friend's flocks, you know, you don't want to go into your friend's barns with the same boots. I kind of talked about it earlier, designated coop shoes. You want them to have some for you if you ever see their flock and you want you to have some for them if they come see yours. 
And then the last one that is really tricky that no one thinks about is stuff like parks. Um, if you go to a park in your boots and you step in some goose poop or some duck poop or something, or maybe your dog does, um, and you bring that home, that will come straight to your chickens and can infect them. And a lot of the cases that are going around the country right now, a lot of the backyard flocks, it might be something like that is how they got the disease is something like maybe their dog stepped in something, they stepped in something and it just brought it to the flock and something you didn't necessarily think about, but it just happens. Um, next thing also with cleanliness and stuff is salmonella risks, keeping the birds separate from you as well as other species. It might be cute to have a duck in your sink, but it brings a lot of disease risk for you and them. Um, kissing chickens, chickens you know, are natural carriers for salmonella, whether they're alive or dead. Um, so always, you know, don't kiss your chicks. Don't put them to your face. Anytime you're done handling them, make sure to wash your hands, wash, you know, whatever you touched with them. Um, so yeah, just make sure you have their own space for them and your own space for you when you're dealing with chickens and ducks and other animals. Next thing I'll talk about is show preparation, whether it's before and after a show, um, if you're going to fairs or shows or, you know, whatever it may be. So make sure you're bringing healthy birds. Um, quick little checks, you know, check for respiratory illnesses. Most poultry diseases are respiratory. They'll show signs of inflammatory um, problems. Maybe they'll have uh, nasal discharge, ocular discharge from their eyes, their nose. Maybe they have plaque in their mouth. Um, always check for bugs. Bugs are very hard to like see, but you want to do good checks. If you feel or see any eggs, make sure you pluck those off and then washing your birds. So washing your birds, a lot of people do this the day before, but honestly, you want to start this about a month ahead of time. Do a quick check for all these things. Give your bird a wash, give it, um, put some, uh, permethrin dust on them, make sure they're clean. And then a week before do it again. And then the day before also do it. You want to make sure they're as clean as they can be before they come to the show, make sure they don't have any bugs. Um, and then anytime you're in doubt, you think they might be feeling sick. You don't want to bring them because if you bring them in a show and they are sick, you brought disease, but you also might, uh, kind of exasperate the problem. A lot of times stress brings out disease in birds if they have it and they're just okay with it. So when in doubt, just leave them at home. And then after event, um, kind of talked about it before, but when you go back, you want to dust and wash them and then quarantine your birds. So at least two weeks when you get back from a show or an event, keep your birds in a separate space who went to the event, make sure they're healthy, make sure they're bug free before you put them back with your flock. If you lose the ones who went, it's better to lose those ones than to lose all of them. Um, and then just reiterating, if you buy new birds, keep them away from your existing flock for at least 30 days. You don't want to put in potential disease into yours. I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten on hotlines about people being like, Oh, my friend gave me some birds. And then now all their birds have Merrix or something. Um, so you want to have a setup to where you can put the birds somewhere else, whether it's a dog crate or pet carrier, maybe a separate coop, you know, whatever you can have to keep the birds away from each other. And so of course, you know, what to do with sick birds. We kind of already talked about it, but get help, you know, see a vet. If you have one, find a vet. Um, you can give us a call. You can tell a 4-H poultry leader, someone who knows a lot about birds. If you call us, we can do an investigation. We can talk you through what might be going on. If you have birds that are dying, always, always, we would recommend a necropsy. Um, this is investigating the dead bird. Uh, it's the best way we can find out whatever disease because diseases are present in so many identical ways. Necropsy is the best way to find out. Um, and then of course, again, take action. If you find a sick bird, if the bird's not feeling well, put it somewhere by itself, observe, record signs, you know, anything that might be out of the ordinary, all the information you can get is helpful to us if, or whoever's helping you in this case. Um, so definitely always take action right as you see anything concerning. Because of course, as I said before, you are the owners of these birds, you are their protection. They can't do what you can. And so you are all the protection that your birds need. Um, and then is there any questions? These are um, some contact information for myself, Heather, who is our coordinator and one of our vet students, uh, as well as the avian hotline phone number and uh, email account.
think that we're getting on the space biosecurity information. Again, everybody will, if you end up with questions later in the presentation and stuff, we can always certainly pass those along to the individual. We appreciate your time and, and we'll let uh, Andrea start the poultry uh, creation. Yeah, and I can stick around for a little bit um, before I get off, just in case anything does pop up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. All right. So I'm going to share my screen now. And we're going to hope it's all going to work. All right. Hopefully you guys are seeing the screen that says Market Poultry 101. Ben, can you see that? Since I can see you on the screen. Yes, I, I can see it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So my name is Andrea Jeter. I am the Montezuma County 4-H program coordinator in Montezuma County, which is Cortez, Colorado, very southwest corner of the state. You can't get me more southwest than we are. And tonight we're here to talk about market poultry. So there is a lot of things in this presentation that are geared towards youth projects, 4-H and FFA members. But if you are not a 4-H and FFA member, we hope that you are here to also learn about these um, different species, the different projects that you guys can, can have. I also would strongly um, recommend the, the rest of the webinar series that we have are going to kind of tie into some of the things that we're talking about um, for both your, your market birds and if you are doing any type of show birds for your county fair. So just kind of the, the kickoff to everything there. Come and join us for the rest of these. So what is a market poultry project? So basically you're raising birds for meat. They're planning to go in somebody's freezer at the end of, of a certain amount of time. 4-H uh, members might be able to, 4-H and FFA might be able to sell their project birds through the county fair. Most of our county fairs do have some sorts of, of junior livestock auction. And different breeds that are used for market projects are usually grown for high growth in a short amount of time. You want them to get big and fat and ready for your freezer in the shortest amount of time possible. Requirements for your market poultry project. This is one of the questions that we get all the time. What do I have to have? What do I need to do? So generally speaking, you need to check with your county. Different counties have different um, requirements. Um, checking with your local extension office or your fairs, uh, your fair association, whether you're going to um, a stock show, whether you're going to an open show, check with that different um, group to see what their individual rules are, because rules vary from fair to fair, show to show. A lot of our shows, when we start talking about market poultry projects, they're going to have ownership dates. There are age requirements for most of these birds. So this is something you definitely want to be able to check into. And then you're going to be able to, to count back from the day of your show to see when you have to have the, that ownership or that hatch date for those age requirements. Most generally, turkeys and ducks are older than our market chickens when you get to a county fair or a show. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. And another thing to keep in mind when you're, you're looking for your requirements, some shows will allow single birds to be shown, some need to have a pair, being a male and a female, and some will require a pin of three. And if there's a pin of three, they're usually of the same sex. So please make sure that if you are showing your birds, if you are planning to do a market poultry project that goes to your county fair, your state fair, a local stock show, Please make sure that you are checking with those rules and regulations as you start your project, because there's nothing worse than getting to the fair and you take in a pen of three animals and they tell you, oh, well, you've got a male and, and two females here, which would make up a normal trio in a breeding class, but in a market class, they may require for them to all be the same age. So when we're looking at market birds, one of the things that we're, we're talking about is industry standard weights and ages. Um, not every fair out there follows these different industry standards and weights. I know our local county fair, we have our rules set up based upon these. Um, I know when I go to the state fair, some of the, the roasters and fryers are definitely older than what you see on here with that, that 10 weeks to eight to 12 weeks. Um, some of them are pushing 16 weeks. 
And we're also looking at, at higher weights by that time. So most generally your turkeys, you're looking at about that 24 weeks maximum. That is the maximum age that they are at the county fair. So you are not taking a year old turkey and putting it into a market class. They need to be young. The young birds make better, better market birds. Ducks, again, 20 weeks maximum. Young birds, some of our Pekin and, and, and some of our market ducks, they're actually ready to butcher um, very similar to these roasters and broilers down here at this 8 to 12 weeks. So again, this is kind of an industry standard, but please check with your local fairs and your roles to find out exactly what your requirements are. So where do you get your market birds? So one of the things I want everybody to understand when we're talking about these market birds, because we get these questions all the time also, is all of these market birds are GMO. They've all been gene genetically modified. There's no way you guys could get those birds to, to look like that without genetically modifying them. They are not genetically modified. They have been bred specifically for the qualities that we now see in these market birds that, that we're bringing to the, the shows. Um, a lot of times there are proprietary crops, meaning the proprietary means whoever put them together is kind of their secret. It's their own little special blend. It's like grandma's special recipe that she doesn't want to give out to anybody. Um, or they're hybrids, which is a cross of different breeds, different types of birds or strains um, that is owned by different producers and hatcheries. Some of the, the hatcheries that you see on here right now are ones that do deal with market birds, whether they be the market turkeys, market ducks, um, are the, the Cornish rock crosses, which we typically see for, for our market birds. Wherever you are going to your birds, just like Ben was talking about a little while ago, make sure that they are participating in some of those monetary programs um, that are checking for, for avian influenza, that are keeping flocks that are good and clean and healthy, because you don't want to get a bunch of these birds in and then have instant problems. Most all of your normal hatcheries, like you see on the, the screen right here, these guys all are participating um, hatcheries. They're ones that if I'm going online and I'm looking for somebody, I will look for that MPIP program stamp on their, their websites. Or I'll even ask them what they, what they are participating in. But you want to start off on a good foot with good chicks before you even get going. So before we go a lot further into this about talking about breeds, I, I want it to kind of go over a couple of little things here because you're going to start hearing these words repetitively, um, especially in a, a poultry project, especially if you are re raising birds of any sort right now, there is a huge thing out there about heritage breeds. So what is a heritage breed? So according to the APA, which is the American Poultry Association, a heritage chicken is one that is hatched from a heritage from a heritage chicken that is sired by an APA standard bred chicken. In layman terms, this means basically it's one of those standard breeds, those purebred birds that the American Poultry Association has recognized as being a breed. The Livestock Conservancy has a little bit different take on it. Um, they've added a couple more things into it. Um, saying that they do need to be one of those purebred. They need to be one of those older breeds, one of those breeds that's been around for a while. One of the key words to see next is that natural mating. There are a lot of birds, especially when we start talking about um, some of these heavy heavyweight birds like our broad-breasted bronze turkeys, um, and even in going into some of our Cornish crosses, a lot of those birds, they do use AI. They are, they are artificially inseminated for them to, to keep re reproducing. So they want our heritage breeds to still be naturally mating. These are your chickens that are running around out in your, your coop. You collect their eggs and those eggs are instantly fertile. They want them to be a long productive outdoor lifespan, meaning that they are able to withstand the growth, withstand that, that normal chicken life without having to have all sorts of special treatment. When you get into our market birds, a lot of our market birds, they take some special treatment to get them to that, that market age. And they want that slow growth rate. That's, that's another difference between when we're looking at something like our Cornish rock crosses versus the, the Red Rangers that we're going to talk about here in a minute. What is a hybrid? Again, something to keep in mind. When we start looking at hybrids, basically they are a mix of something. They're the mutts of the, the chicken world. 
whether they're a mix of, of select lines, like with our, our Cornish rock crosses or our Cornish cross meat birds, that they've taken very, very specific lines for the characteristics that those birds show. And they are now throwing those um, into breeding pens or they're, they're AIing off of those, or whether they are just taking purebred parents and breeding them together to get something such as the, the golden comets or the sex links or some of those, those egg laying lines that we see a lot of. But basically, they are the mutts. They are the mixed breed of, of the chicken world. So starting to talk a little bit about market chickens. So in going through this um, and putting this presentation together, we concentrated on basically the three main types that we see in, in the 4-H world and at our, our local shows, which are your chickens, your turkeys, and your ducks. Now, there are some other birds out there. We're going to talk a little bit about them tonight, but tonight we're going to mostly concentrate on our, our typical ones that we see. So if you are raising market chickens, the most common market chicken out there is a Cornish rock cross or a Cornish cross. And these are typically a commercial Cornish. And I, I put heavy emphasis on the commercial because if you know what a actual American Poultry Association Cornish chicken looks like. It, it is not the same as a, Cornish, a commercial Cornish. So they're taking that commercial Cornish, which is usually one of those pr proprietary hybrids, and they are crossing it to a white Plymouth rock. And the reason why they're doing that is they're doing it so that fertility rate is there. So somebody is laying eggs. Because as you can see, this bird over here doesn't look like your typical bird, kind of the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger bird going on over here they are not meant for long-term breeding. They are not meant to live very long. They are meant to grow and go into your freezer. Um, they are very fast growing. They frequently reach, reach that, you know, seven to 10 pounds at eight weeks. I know here at our local county fair, we're usually right at seven weeks when we're butchering our chickens and we cannot have anything over nine pounds. Our lowest weight that we'll allow is four and a half pounds. So these are very, very quick growing chickens. If you've ever gotten the little Cornish rock hens at the, the grocery store, those cute little packages look like little turkeys. This is what you are eating. You are eating a Cornish rock cross. They are just being butchered or processed at a very early age, usually right around that four pounds in four weeks. One thing to note, depending on where you are with Cornish rock crosses, they can be harder to raise at higher elevations. There are some hatcheries that will actually look up your zip code and look up your elevation, and they may not sell you the chicks. Um, Murray McMurray has, has been one of those in the past that, especially in Colorado, it's been hard to get chicks from them because anything over 8,000 feet, they generally will not sell these, these broilers to. Um, here in, in Southwest Colorado, we're, we're right there between that 6,000 to 7,000 feet. Our local 4-H kids, we do raise a, a Cornish Rock Cross for our county fair, and we've had a great success in doing so. If you live in one of those places that's way higher, higher elevation, you get into that eight to nine to 10,000 range that we do have in Colorado, um, you might want to start looking at it going a different route. Than, than doing your Cornish rock crosses. Another thing that I cannot stress enough is these are not egg layers. Every year after the county fair, every year after you get to one of your, your livestock sales, I hear everybody going, oh yeah, we'll just take them home and let them lay eggs. These birds are not meant to live past that normal processing weight. They have too many problems. They're very, very heavy. They grow very fast. You'll start having, you know, broken legs. You can start having flip over disease. We'll talk a little bit more about all these differences in, in um, health problems here in a minute also. So what do you do if you are living at that higher elevation or you want something that's a little bit slower growing? Well, they have developed what they, they generally refer to as a Freedom Ranger or a Red Ranger. And these are taking that same commercial Cornish, um, that heavyweight breed, and breeding it to a heritage type bird. So taking one of those Cornish and breeding it, say, to your Rhode Island Reds, your New Hampshire's, your Delaware's, um, Jersey Giants even. Again, there are certain breeds that they've mixed together to really come back with this, this hybrid bird that is a lot slower growing. Um, they do make a lot better if you're going to be doing pasture-raised market birds, if you're, you're doing that a um, little bit longer, you want that pasture, you're putting them out in, into to chicken tractors. 
Um, you're not looking to just make that county fair within that that six to eight weeks. Um, these guys are really good for, for going out and foraging. They're way more active than what your Cornish crosses are. And to their credit, they've said that they are definitely more flavorable. Um, they tend to have a little bit higher of the dark meat quality on them than the, the regular Cornish do. And just slowing down that growth on them changes the, the quality of the meat, changes the flavor of the meat. But again, these are not egg layers. These guys are just for raising for that end result of having something that's going into your freezer. We see a lot of this in, in some of the niche marketing, um, farmers markets, things like that. We're starting to see a lot of these longer growing birds coming into play. I do know that there are county fairs, there are shows that may have a separate class um, just for the Freedom Rangers so that they're not competing against those Cornish because of those age, age categories. So again, check what your local um, regulations are, your local rules. If you're raising, if you're looking to raise market birds just for some home production, you're looking for something to, to do um, maybe in that niche marketing, um, there are what we call multi-purpose breeds. And the, these are really great breeds to have on your farms, to have on, on your small homesteads, because you can use them for both meat and eggs. That's the part of the multi-purpose. Um, they are slow growing. These are your normal breeds, your, your Plymouth Rock, your New Hampshire's, your Jersey Giants, your Rhode Island Reds. There are a ton of these type of breeds out there. It takes them a lot longer to reach that five to six pounds. You're looking at that six to eight months. Whereas with our Cornish or even our, our Red Rangers, you're reaching that five to six pounds in under four months. So if you're looking for something to have for both meat and eggs, these are great to have. It's really also a, a great thing if you're raising these and you have an incubator, great way to use those extra cockerels that you're going to have every time you start hatching. Um, keep the hens for, for your eggs and put the cockerels in your freezer. Market turkeys. So this is probably one of the biggest questions that we always get is what kind of turkeys do we really have to have? And can I use my blank? for my market projects. To understand the differences between um, the two different types of turkey types, there are, just like in the chickens, we have things that have been developed in the market for the industry to be able to get to the highest growth rate in the shortest amount of time, the best feed conversion. So that's where we get into our broad-breasted. Broad-breasted turkeys come in both in two varieties. They come in white and they also come in a bronze. The white is obviously over here on the, the left-hand side at the top and your bronze down here at the bottom looks like a little bit more traditional turkey. As you guys can see, these turkeys look a lot like what our Cornish did. They've got a really wide breast on them. They've got big, heavy feet on them, trying to support that extra weight that these birds have in that, that quick growth. The flip of our turkey breeds that are out there, the American Poultry Association actually recognizes all turkeys as being one breed, but they have different varieties. And those are what they're, they're um, commonly referring back to as our heritage breeds. So your Royal Palms, your Bourbon Reds, Narragansetts, Blacks, Bronze, Slates, White Holland, Beltsville Whites, those are all different heritage type turkeys. They work very well for homesteads and small turkey meat production but you do not have the same amount of meat. That quantity of meat is totally different coming off of one of these bourbon reds compared to a bronze. This is that difference between raising that Cornish cross chicken versus your Rhode Island red. The meat quality, the meat um, quantity is totally different on these birds that have been specifically bred and raised for that, that meat industry. Again, our broad-breasted turkeys, they're the most commercially bred. This is what you see every, every year at, at Thanksgiving. Um, the one going to the White House to get pardoned, that's going to still be one of these broad-breasted. They are very fast growing. You're looking at that, that, that 10 to 12 pound carcass in less than 18 weeks. You can get, and we actually have when at our county fair, 24 weeks is the maximum that they can have. We actually have kind of got it down to around 20 weeks and we're getting those 40 pound toms at our county fair. They are very, very quick. The downside to our broad-breasted varieties is they are not meant to reproduce naturally. These birds, again, are terminal. They grow too big 
They cannot mate. They will hurt each other. They have leg problems if they're allowed to go past that maturity of, of being processed. Our heritage, again, just like we were just talking about with our Cornish versus our, our normal laying hens or our multi-purpose hens, they are very slow growing. Um, you're looking at that 24 to 36 weeks to get up here into those, those 10, to 10 to 12 pound carcasses. But again, they are considered more fav flavorable. Slower growing tends to, e to equal more flavor. Um, they are able to natural breed. I actually have some of these turkeys at my house. Um, and every year she sets a clutch and, and hatches out, out um, little poults that run around. They're great foragers. They're great to have around, especially if you have gardens, they're, they're into the bugs. Um, and they can be good seasonal egg layers. Again, if you're looking for something to, to raise, just to put some meat on your table and we'll have some, some multi-purpose turkeys running around out there, these heritage birds are great because you can go out when you decide you want to butcher some birds and, and you know, pick out your toms and, and go ahead and, and process them. You're broad-breasted, you're going to be processing all of them at the same time. They, they all have that terminal time limit on them. Penn State Extension has done a lot of, of research um, around turkey production. So here's just some, some averages on how big some of these hens and how some of these toms can get when we're talking about the broad-breasted white. Broad-breasted whites are most generally the most popular of the, the market varieties. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that in a minute when we get, to, uh, get past the ducks. But white is most generally your, your most popular. But when we're getting up into this 20 pounds, you know, that live weight on these toms being, being up there closer to that 40, our hens being 25, those are very, very big birds. Something to think about when you're looking at that is we're talking about our county fairs. We're going, yes, I want that bigger bird. Bigger is better. I want that 40 pound bird. So broad-breasted turkeys generally have about an 80% mate yield. So this means that when you have that 40-pound tom, when you're putting that turkey into your oven, you're putting a 32-pound turkey in there. I don't know how big your family is, but you're going to be have having turkey sandwiches for days after you put a 40-pound tom in your freezer. This is not what we necessarily want to start seeing. Um, I know to process one of these, it, you're getting into really, really big birds. If you are lucky enough to have somebody that does process your turkeys around, they don't like to do them this big. They're hard to handle. Um, the feathers are starting to get pretty tough on them. So coming back down to some of these middle 30 pounds, if you're going to a county fair, those are good weights that are going to give you still a good size turkey to, to be finished with on that dressing weight on them. But they're also usable sizes. Something to think about when if you're not doing a 4-H project and you're looking for just marketable birds, um, not everybody is looking for a 25-pound turkey. There's people that are looking for these 15 to 20 pounds. So maybe thinking about dressing them out sooner when they're, they're a little bit younger versus them going to that full, full 40 pounds is, is a better idea. You're also going to start saving on some of your feed costs if you're, you're processing them earlier. Our heritage turkeys, they have about 75% or less of their meat yield as compared to the, the broad-breasted at that 80%. So they are going to be that smaller dressed out weight. If you look over here, if you've got that, that 19 to 20 pounds, you're looking at a 15 pound turkey. So again, these are really good if, if you're um, looking for some backyard birds to raise that you can, can raise out during the summer and use for Thanksgiving dinner. Using some of these heritage turkeys might be a very good plan for your operation. Market ducks. Market ducks have also become very, very popular, especially in the 4-H world in, in Colorado. Um, Pekin ducks are the, usually the most common market breed. They're also called the American Pekings or jum Jumbo Pekings. Um, these are large birds. These are not your typical little white duck that you see. Um, I caution when you start looking for ducks, make sure that you are looking for either this American Pekin or this Jumbo Pekin because these are bigger than the normal white duck that the feed store has. Um, as we talked about earlier, these guys can grow very, very quickly. Now, they're not as heavy as what we're looking at with our turkeys, 
um, we're looking at that seven to eight pounds um, in eight to 10 weeks. Ducks grow very, very fast. So these guys are, are just like your little broilers. They're a fast growing bird. They're going to go on your table. Um, these jumbos are not meant to be breeders. They're not meant to go out on your, your family pond. They are meant as a table duck. They are meant to go in your freezer. And one of the nicest things about these, these Pekin ducks is they were bred to actually dress cleanly. Um, especially when we start talking about some of the colored birds, um, you start seeing a lot of pin feathers coming out as they get older. And I said earlier, when you start looking at these market birds, you'll start seeing kind of a, a trend that they're all white. One of the reasons are is the white birds tend to be easier to clean. They don't show the feathers. They don't show any of these colored pin feathers um, and they're easier to pluck. They're easier to get those feathers out of as opposed to some of the colored birds. So there's, there's a reason that's kind of part of the breeding that they have into them is, is being able to, to clean nicely. There are other, other heavyweight ducks that can be used. Um, some of the other most common are muscovies, the ruins. I will again state not hatchery quality. I, I put a couple of pictures down here of the difference in these ruins. A lot of the feed stores, people go and get these and they'll say, oh, look, we got mallards. They're not mallards. Mallards are tiny. Mallards are a bantam duck. Ruins from, from a hatchery tend to be a lot smaller. They're more cylindrical in their shape as opposed to these ruins. You can see these are very deep bodied. These birds are basically the equivalent of the, the white Pekin duck. They're just in a colored in a, a gray variety. Muscovies are a very heavy duck. One of the great things about muscovies is they tend to set large clutches of eggs um, commonly having up to 30 babies at a time. These guys are like just little birds on crack laying out all those eggs, man. They have babies galore. Really nice because you can, can take those extra drakes, use them for the, the meat and keep those hens for eggs. There are a lot of different counties that have a high demand for duck eggs. Um, it's become a, a big niche market. So muscovies have become very popular again because they, they are that definite multi-purpose breed. told you earlier, we talked about those three main, main species, but there are some other market poultry projects that you guys can do, whether you're in 4-H or whether it's something that you just are interested in raising. Quail has really come back. Our little Courtney's quail, our, our bobwhite quail, we're starting to see quite a bit more of these. They're also becoming popular for their eggs again. Ringneck neck pheasants and chucker partridge. Um, these are beautiful birds. There's a lot of people that are putting them out there. Um, some of the restaurants will pay, pay big bucks for our ringnecks and, and for our partridges. The one thing you need to make sure you are doing before purchasing any of these game birds for your market projects is you need to check with your local reg regulations before you put purchase them. Whether that's through your city, whether that's through your county, or whether that's even through your Department of Wildlife, there are various assorted requirements out there for keeping some of these birds, and some counties um, restrict that ownership completely. So definitely something to make sure that you check out before you purchase these birds. So you finally have decided what you're going to do, which, which project you're going to get. Um, you've ordered your birds, they're coming in, you're going to the, the feed store to pick them up, whatever you guys are doing. You need to make sure you're getting day old chicks, whether they're turkeys, whether they're, they're ducklings, whether they're, they're chicks, they are all going to need some supplemental heat after they hatch. So regardless of what kind of setup you are using, whether you're using these type of heater plates, um, which are really nice, they kind of uh, take out the, the dangers of heat lamps. If you are using a heat lamp, I do not personally like heat lamps. I've used them for years and I occasionally will still have to hold one up if I've got more hatched out than what I had planned to at a time. Make sure your heat lamps are secure, guys. There is nothing worse than losing your entire barn or your entire flock because a heat lamp fell down. Chickens generate a lot of dander. That dander and dust gets up there. It can actually make these bulbs explode. And now you, you have fried chicken without meaning to have fried chicken. So make sure whatever heat source you are using that you are, are securing it and that the, these little guys are not in danger of these falling down. 
when you get your newly hatched chicks, you are looking at, you got to keep in mind when you're hatching those birds, you're between 99.5 and 100 degrees. They need to have that, that good high temperature when you very first bring them home. And then you can start decreasing it. Um, here's an example of, of good versus bad. This little guy right here where the little birds are all over. Um, one of the biggest ways you can tell if there's something going on with your, your chicks or, or your ducklings or your poults is if they're making a lot of noise, something is not right. Whether they're cold, whether they're hot, something's going on. Even if their water is, is out, this is, this is a good way to know there's something happening. If the chicks are too hot, they may be totally silent. But again, you can see them. They're spread out. They're away from that heat source. Too cold, they're going to be jumbled up. They're going to be all on top of each other. And you're going to hear them squawking. They're going to be chirping and carrying on in there. One of the biggest killers of our biggest birds is having some sort of a draft in there. If there is a draft coming from one side, they have a tendency to pile up on top of each other. And they may even get out of that heat source because they're trying to get out of that breeze that's causing that discomfort. And they'll start suffocating each other. A lot of times you will hear a lot of noise again because they're not happy. When, when chicks are happy, they tend to be nice and quiet. Some other special considerations that you need to, to keep in mind when you're talking about our chicks of any type, whether they're market birds or whether there they're are other type of special birds, what's their rate of feathering? How many of the birds are being housed together? What's the temperature outside? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? As we start getting into to June in Colorado, when we start looking at having our, our market birds, our daytime temperatures could be up into the 90s, but our nighttime temperatures could still be dropping down into the 40s. Some of these birds may not be feathered out at a, a high enough rate to be able to withstand those temperatures. I just kind of talked about this, but if your daytime temperatures are above the temperature in your brooder, your chicks may be too hot to keep that heat lamp on. They may even... Um, as we start getting closer to fair, your birds might actually need to be cooled off during the day. They may need a fan on them. But at the same time, just like I said, at night, your temperatures might be dropping to where those birds are getting too cold. So what are the housing requirements for market, per market projects um, or market birds in general? So it really depends, again, on what, what species you're raising. There are all sorts of different um, housing setups out there. We'll talk a little bit about that. But some of the general rules of thumb is you are going to need two to three square feet per bird. Um, if you look at the commercial um, broiler farms or turkey farms, you'll see them in there, those huge barns that are just stuffed full of birds. Those birds need that two to three square feet to be able to move around. So for the kids that are on, if you want to look at what two to three square feet is, most of our floors have tiles on them that are a foot square. That's a way that you can look at it. Those birds need that two to three feet for per bird to be able to move around. Not a whole lot of room, but market birds need, move, need room to move. These birds are lazy. They want to sit and eat and poop and drink and eat and poop and drink. That's what they live for. They also need a secure location. These are not the brightest birds, hence the fact that I have our little dodo birds over here. That's actually what we call them fondly at our house is the dodo or fat birds. They are not smart. They are not meant to be out there looking for predators. They're not looking up at that hawk that's going over. If there's food in front of them and there's a dog coming up behind them, they don't even see that dog. If you are raising market ducks, you do not need a pond. In fact, ducks do not need to have water to swim in to be healthy and, and happy. Of course, they probably are a little bit happier with having something to, to clean themselves off in, but they do need to just have water that's, that's deep enough for them to dip, dip their entire bill in, in order to be able to scoop up that water to clean out their nostrils. So that's something that's really nice if you want to go into to looking at raising market ducks, is you do not have to, to have a pond. When we start talking about housing our market, our market poultry, something to keep in mind is you do not want perches in these pens. Where we normally will have perches in our normal poultry pens for our, our other birds, our egg laying birds, these birds are too heavy. They are too off-centered with the large breast meat that we have bred them for. And when they jump off those perches, they can start hurting their legs. It can also lead to breast injuries, 
they're falling on the ground. They may be getting splinters into their breasts, which then leads to breast blisters and can cause further problems down the line. So here's some just good examples of some kind of tractor, um, chicken tractors up here. These can be moved very easily, keeping the birds out on pasture. Here's a great example of just a, an easy, I've actually seen these made with using old trampolines and, and doing a hoop house with the trampolines. Um, because most of our poultry projects, our market poultry projects are short-term projects, it's really nice to have one of these that can be broke down and, and you know, put aside throughout the year until that short period of time, that, that two to four months that you're actually using them. And then even when we're talking about like our, our duck projects, our turkey projects, even having them out in a pasture with a, a um, electric fence around them to help keep predators out of there or keep the turkeys or, or ducks in, um, these actually work very successfully too. One of the things you need to try to do if you are raising a market project is keep your birds up and moving. The more dormant they become, the more immobile that they can become and the heavier that they get, they are not going to want to walk around. So placing your feet in water at opposite sides of your pins actually helps to encourage their movement. Um, if you elevate your food up on, on blocks as the birds grow, so maybe as chicks, they're, they're only up on a two by four, and then you put two by, two by fours, then you put a brick, and then you put a, a cinder block, elevating that, that food in water so that they actually have to stretch up to, to get it actually encourages them to move. It helps them keep those muscles moving in the breast um, and helps prevent some things like woody breast and, and also helps keep these clean. Like I said, these birds are dumb. They are these dodo birds completely. They want to eat and drink. If you allow one of these, these feeders to be on the ground and you will go out and look and see all your birds will just be laying right here around the outside of the water or the feeder. They won't even get up. So keep those at opposite ends. Um, I know when my daughter was, was still doing 4-H, we had the water inside a hutch that was up and elevated that they were locked up into at night. And we actually had a ramp that went down and went about 20 feet over to where their feeder was. So those birds had to move back and forth. And that, that definitely helps keeping them, them mobile. So what are the feed requirements for market turkeys? Again, this is probably one of the, the number one questions that we get in extension or your poultry leaders get is, well, what do I feed them? What, what's the secrets? What should I, what should I do? There are, we're not gonna go into real specifics about the different tricks in, of the trade. That's something that you should be talking to other people about and learning what works best for your own situation. Um, Different places, of course, we've got lots of people on from different um, states. We've got Idaho, we've got Wyoming. I don't know exactly what your feed dealer has. But when you are looking for market poultry feed, please, please, please do not get caught up in the mixing your own feed and taking soybeans and black sunflower seeds and whatever, 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 and mixing it together. Use what we call a complete feed. These are actually um, put together by nutritionists that are, are employed by these different companies, and they are made to put all the different types of, of nutrients that your birds need into one pellet, one mash, whatever it is. It takes the guesswork out of making sure that they get all the nutrients that they need. This also helps them to grow and, and put that feed conversion. Anytime you're doing a, a market project, you want to be able to use the less amount of feed that increases your profit margin by the time you get to fair because you didn't put as much feed into them for that, that, that gain that these birds are, are having. Um, one thing to definitely note is turkeys, ducks, and game birds have higher protein need than chickens. Now, caveat on that, ducks um, are are kind of weird. <laughs> Ducks have some different nutritional requirements. Um, and a lot of times it's hard to get a good duck feed at any of, of our local feed stores, especially if you're in a rural area. Um, when we start out our ducks, a lot of people are putting them on turkey feeds, um, thinking that they need that really high protein to start, like some of these game birds that are at 30%, um, or even feeding an all flock, which is usually a 20 to 22% protein. Ducks have some special issues if they're fed too much protein early on and they start getting some issues like angel wing, which is where the, the wings kind of flop out instead of being nicely tucked into their bodies. So if you are raising market ducks, I highly recommend talking to your feed store 
and seeing if they can order in a specific diet that has been made for your ducks. So generally speaking, again, we're talking in general terms tonight because we do have people in, in different places. But generally speaking, your market chickens are going to be starting out at a 20 to 24% protein. Depending on the, the manufacturer of your feed, you may be seeing a starter that may only be 20%. They may have a starter that's 24%. Turkeys, 24 to 30%, and market ducks, that 18 to 20%. These are starting rations. There are different types of, of rations out there. You usually hear about a starter, a grower, and a finisher, just like we do with our, our larger livestock. Um, if you are raising these regular broad-breasted, these, these most common breeds, you are looking for probably a starter and a grower. You're probably never going to get to a finisher because the short amount of time that, that you should be using um, to raise these birds to a marketable age. If you are raising something like the Red Rangers, um, maybe some of your heritage turkeys, you might want to be able to switch them over to that finisher to kind of um, finish that weight on them while, while saving a little bit of cost. Usually that, that lower protein doesn't have as much cost per bag on them. So one, one big thing that's a big controversy out there is, is when do you feed your market poultry? So birds eat when they have light. Birds are notorious for not being able to see in the dark. Um, so when you're putting heat lamps on your birds, they have light. If it's not a red light, they're actually seeing that light. So they're going to eat as long as there's food out there. When they're newly hatched, of course, you should always have free access to those, those um, feeders for those birds. But as you start getting into that four to six week range, when you're talking about your, your Cornish or your, your market chickens, you might want to start thinking about how you can control that, that eating. Um, chickens are obviously only able, just like us, they can only eat so much food that is actually being used by them. So if you're seeing a lot of really loose stool from your birds, they're pooping out just water, you probably need to start thinking about changing up some of the food or maybe starting to restrict from this, some restrict some of their food because they are actually just wasting that feed. That feed is going in and out of them faster than they're, they're shoveling it in. If you guys have watched, if, if you can tell, I'm a fan of Ice Age, but if you've watched Ice Age, the last melon, that is how these birds are every single minute of the day. They will act like they are starving plumb to death. They're lying to you. They're not starving to death. But you can use that, that restricting that feed or even turning off those lights at night to help control some of that growth and that weight. If you start seeing that you're starting to have some leg problems, you start thinking that maybe you start are getting into some overweight birds, or even if you're trying to have like at our county fair where we have two different categories, we have a fryer class and we have a roaster class and you've got those birds at the same time. So you're wanting to push some to a heavier weight and you're trying to hold some at a little bit lower weight. You can easily do that by, by just the amount of food that you're giving those birds. Medicated versus non-medicated feed, especially in, in poultry, has, has really become a big deal. Again, I go down to it as a personal preference. Um, medicated starter rations help you prevent coccidiosis. Um, but if you are using a medicated feed, you do need to know what the withdrawal time is. You cannot put a market bird on just a chick starter that is medicated and feed it that chick starter until it's butchered. There is a withdrawal time on there. Those of you guys that are in 4-H, you know what that withdrawal time is. If you've taken your MQA classes, you need to make sure that you are taking that feed off and switch to something else that does not interfere with, with that processing time on them. Again, I go back to it being a personal choice. Some of our, our meat birds, um, our, our complete feeds do not have any type of, of medicated um, antibiotic in it. These antibiotics, um, amprolium is usually what's put in, into our starter rations to help prevent coccidiosis. It is just a preventative. It is not used to treat those birds. Um, and so that's why we're just using it for that short amount of time. By the time, I should say when we're talking about this, by the time those animals go to fair, they shouldn't have anything. There should be, when those animals are processed, there should be no type of, of antibiotic. There should be no type of hormones. There should be no type of anything in them other than just that straight com, um, complete feed. 
So market bird health is a little bit different than, than our normal birds. Um, these birds being bred to have that fast growth rate can lead to all sorts of problems. And I always go back to what our dear Benjamin Franklin said about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you try to prevent some of these things from happening, it is so much better than trying to treat them. Doing simple things like not having perches in your, your market bird pens, that helps prevent those leg injuries. If you're starting to watch some of your birds, if you've got some of those birds that may be getting a little heavy and they're starting to limp, if you go ahead and process those birds early, you're preventing them from suffering by having any of those further, further health issues. So some of the most common issues that we see with our market birds, and this doesn't, this is not species dependent. This is, is across the board, market birds, turkeys, ducks, um, our, our market chickens. Because these birds are raised to grow so fast, sometimes their legs are not keeping up with the growth and their legs are just not strong enough to hold them up. You'll start seeing lameness. At the first sight of any lameness in any of these market birds, you should go ahead and process that bird. Heart attacks, um, this is especially what you see if you're raising some of the birds at a higher altitude. It's also called flip over disease. Basically, the body is growing faster than what the heart can support and pushing out that blood and, and those nutrients, and it can kill them very quickly. So if you go out to your pen and you see one of these birds laying on its back with its feet straight up in the air, this is why it's, it's coined the name flip over disease. They've probably had a heart attack. They flipped over and died. This also holds true when we're talking about any of our, our normal poultry any of our egg layers or our multi-purpose breeds, they can also do the exact same thing. If they're on their back with their feet straight up, they probably had a heart attack. Quarter belly or ascites, this is something that, um, again, is, is related to the heart. It has to do with the fact that they're not getting enough oxygen pushed around through their body. Um, we start having some dialysis going into our bellies um, and, and they get this really jiggly looking abdomen. Um, if you start seeing those birds kind of laying around panting, not looking like they're feeling good, um, again, time to, to, to process those birds. Because these birds grow so fast, the, the temperature of a, a normal chicken is 107 degrees. These are hot. Birds are hot. When you walk in and you feel some of these birds, just picking up one of these little roaster birds, you can just feel how hot they are. So when we have a 90 degree day in June or July out there, these birds are prone to heat stroke. They are prone to just not dealing with that heat. Our birds, um, all poultry tends to tolerate cold better than they do heat. So this is why I'm saying you may be needing to look to put some fans out there on those birds, making sure that they've got lots of fresh water, making sure that they've got shade to get in. Um, I know here in, in Southwest Colorado, um, when my daughter was raising these birds, we did put fans on these birds every day, and then they had a heat lamp at night to keep them comfortable. You should know the signs of heat stroke on those birds. Um, they will be laying out with their feathers out. They'll be panting. They will be hot. You can tell. Another problem that we have with these birds is breast blisters. Because they are so heavy and because they are lazy, they like to just sit around and, and lay on that breast. Our breast is the flaming on of our, our birds. That is the highest and most expensive cut off of our birds. That's what a lot of these birds, especially like ducks, that's something that, that's usually the only usable part when we're, we're butchering them. So we want to try to prevent those breast blisters. Some of those ways to prevent that is to keep those birds up and moving. Having food at one end, having water at the other end, making them get up and, and move around, having them stretch out, making sure you don't have any of those perches, perches that they're jumping off of so that they're, they're getting splinters into their breasts will help prevent some of these breast, breast blisters. So if you are in 4-H, you know we are always hounding you about your record books. But if you are raising any type of, of livestock for um, meat, if they are going on somebody's table, record keeping is hugely important. So using leg bands or wing bands, some of your counties may actually wing band or leg bands them before you even get your birds. But if they don't, or if you are raising some backyard birds for any type of, of processing, Using some simple leg bands, you can order them online. You can, can usually get them down at your feed store. These were actually, this is actually my daughter several years ago. We just purchased some of these, these normal numbered leg bands. And when the birds were big enough, we had two different sizes. 
um, with their big fat legs, whether they're turkeys, whether they're ducks, whether they're chickens, they usually have those big fat legs. And so these type of bands stay on. You can also use zip ties in order to, to identify your birds, but you need to make sure you are checking those legs. Um, more often than not, I see zip ties that come in or, or a bird that comes to one of our county fairs or to a meeting and the zip tie is, is starting to grow into the leg because they haven't been changed out and these birds have grown so much in even a week that, that we have to, to cut those bands out. Please, 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 if you're using zip ties, make sure that you have, have them loose enough to account for those, those birds' growth. These little bands, we actually go from this stage right here with this little bird. In three weeks, we move up to a, a larger band size. That's how quick these birds grow. But by having these numbered bands, by having, the, having some sort of identifying um, mark on your birds, you can also keep track of things like um, how they're growing, how fast they're growing which can help when you start picking out your, your different birds for fair. You can also start looking down and say, hey, I've got six birds that look like they're, they're almost reaching my target weight, so I need to plan on when I'm going to process. Start gathering up all the supplies that you need for the processing of your birds. Record keeping is also very important. Of course, if you're 4-H and FFA, you've got those lovely record books that you've got to do. Keeping track of your feed ratios, knowing how much feed is, is going into each one of those birds. Sometimes um, keeping track of feed ratios can, can be very beneficial if you have gotten different strains of birds or you've used different hatcheries over the years. Um, you may start seeing some different feed ratios going in. These birds this year from this hatchery may have grown faster and I, I used less feed on them than I did from, from hatchery C. If you've given any medications, if you're looking at those withdrawal times, um, if you're staggering how many the market birds that you have so that you, you butcher one set in August, you butcher another in, in September, making sure that you can identify which birds are, are at what stage with their medications and the with, withdrawal times. Again, it may be required by law to keep these, these records. If you are doing any cottage food sales, um, it's actually not under the Cottage Food Act, but under the meat sales, if you are selling off your farm, you are required by law to keep these type of records for two years. It's just a good husbandry practice. Just make sure you get into the habit of, of checking on them. Even if you're not doing individual birds, like you may be able to do for 4-H, if you are raising uh, market birds to put out in the pasture to, to use as a niche marketing, you're, you're selling off of your farm, make sure that, that those um, batches of birds are identified in some manner. If you've got different, if you're staggering your, your growth on them, um, maybe having a red pin and a green pin, you know, even if they're not numbered individually, you know exactly which one is which. So especially for each kids, easy, easy, easy ways to weigh your birds. There are normal kitchen scales that you can get that are these nice little digital scales, put some sort of a, a tub on top of them. You can be able to tell what your, your weight is, um, Preferably, especially if you're doing ducks, if you're doing turkeys, some of these pet scales, a um, hundred bucks on Amazon, you can usually find one of these nice pet scales that they can just walk on. If you have turkeys, you know that it is really hard to, to hold those turkeys still. So having one of these type of walk on scales is really, really nice. The key to weighing your birds is you want to weigh them at the same time of day so that you're getting accurate weight, right, accurate weights. If you're weighing your bird in the morning and then you go out and feed it and it has all day to sit around and then you weigh it the next night, those birds are going to have very, very different weights on them. Um, we tend to recommend that you, you feed or you weigh your birds first thing in the morning before you fed them. Another thing to think about is if you are going to show when is the weigh in time, because you are going to want to be weighing your birds at the same time as your weigh in because that is going to give you that accurate weight on them. Um, you can also hold your feet or you can, can push their feet if, if you're running into those situations. But if you weigh your bird before you feed it and then three hours after you feed it, you are going to get very different weights. We've seen weights vary up to a pound in those different times of day. Very quickly, we could talk about picking your market birds for a show out for hours and hours and hours. 
Um, if there's enough interest, we can definitely, you know, circle back to this as we get closer to fair. But if you are picking market birds for a show, the first and foremost thing you need to do is make sure what your requirements are for your pins. If you need a pair and it needs to be a male and a female, you better get to getting out there and figuring out what you've got. If you need a pin that's all three of the same sex, like these ducks right here, um, ducks are notorious for, for at the age that they're coming in, that those males may not have their sex feathers to be able to tell. So really paying attention to your bird to start seeing exactly what they are. Um, in our, our roasters and our broilers, um, sometimes you can start telling a, a big difference just because of the comb size on your, your cockerels. They may be a little bit redder in your cockerels or, or paler in your hens, but really start watching and knowing what your requirements are going to be. The biggest key to any type of pin, now this is not a single, if you're doing a single roaster or a single fryer or a single turkey, if you are doing a pin of chickens, more than one, uniformity is the thing that you are looking for. The closest weight you can get, looking at the width of the back, the length of the keel, the size of their leg bones, and the feel of those muscles. And when you start putting your hands on some of these market birds, or if you ever get a chance, if you're just starting out, go feel the market birds at your county fair. You can start telling a difference in, in how those muscles and that, that breast feel. One of my, my famous stories that I tell is I, I had four boys and I sent them all out to pick their, their market turkeys or their market chickens one day. And my oldest son went out and he found all three chickens that weighed the exact same size and he was done. That was it. That was going to be, be his, his pen of chickens. But what he didn't do is he didn't feel the size of their legs. He just went off of weight. And when that judge came in, he got to laughing and he said, man, this tur or this chicken has a, a leg that's the size of a turkey and it just throws off this entire pen. So just going off of weight can be a huge mistake. Make sure that you're feeling the rest of these things, making sure that they all look the same. Um, when you're looking down at these birds, some of the birds are, are more oval shaped and some of them are more heart shaped. Make sure that you are, are getting all three birds looking the same and look at them from all angles. Um, again, just making sure that they're as uniform as you possibly can get them. We're not going to talk a whole lot about processing tonight because the good news is, is we are hoping to do a processing webinar in one of our future webinars. Um, I don't know if we've announced that date or not. Um, Christine, if we have, if you can put that in the chat for us, but we will be doing a separate um, webinar on just processing your birds. If you are looking for processors out there, unfortunately, we do not have a whole lot in Colorado that actually will accept poultry. It's not a licensing issue. It's just that they choose not to because that profit margin is a little bit different there. There's some cleanup and some special um, requirements that they have when they're purchasing or when they're processing these birds. So a lot of times you're going to be learning to do these, these birds at home. The bonus to, to raising these, these market birds, you can process up to a thousand birds on your farm. You can't go to somebody else's house. You can't take them somewhere else, but you can process up to a thousand birds annually on your farm without any additional permits. And this is a thousand birds. It can be a combination of turkeys and ducks and chickens and pheasants. It can be a combination just as long as it's under a thousand birds. The biggest thing is you have to make sure you are keeping these, these records. There are some specific labeling requirements that we'll talk more about when we come down to that, that processing um, webinar that we have in the future, um, because it, it does get pretty specific on things. But if you are raising market birds, you need to have a plan on how you are going to process them, because it is most likely going to be up to you to do so.